Thank you. Uh, now I will uh, open up for questions. Uh, when you ask your question, please uh, state your name and uh, who you represent. First question. Thank you very much. Ines Trasdeny, Radio Latvia. My question to uh, Mr. Bridlov. Uh, I would like to know how do you see proposal from the Baltic states uh, expressed in the letter and, and uh, submitted to you to provide even more intensive uh, training in the Baltics that uh, NATO forces there would be almost constantly through the year? Thank you. We just literally received this letter uh, in my office just the day before the conference, and so we've had a, a chance to take a look at it, and we divided sort of, in my opinion, uh, about seven or eight tasks that they've asked us to look at. I must tell you that I'm very uh, encouraged in that the work that we have been doing since the Wales Conference, and I look at that work at my headquarters in coordination with Jean Paul's headquarters and have handed off much of it already, to the military committee. We've already addressed, I think, over half of their requests. There are some new ones on there that we'll have to take under advisement. Uh, we'll go back to our staffs and look at the feasibility of those requests and pass those up through the leadership um, after Jean-Paul and I have looked at them, uh, and we'll put our recommendations before the committee. Next question. Yes, uh, Gérard Godin, Belgian News Agency. Um, a question for, I don't know who exactly, but NATO is going to retire a few AWACS. Uh, are you able to do what you have done in the past with uh, 14 aircraft? So, uh, first and foremost, uh, our AWACS fleet is one of the most modern flying, and that's because NATO has done a good job in continuing to upgrade those aircraft. Right now, we plan to upgrade uh, 14 of the, or 11 of those 14 aircraft. We have only made a decision to divest one at this moment. Any, few, any further decisions have to be looked at down the road. But these aircraft have performed magnificently. We just recently brought them home from Afghanistan, where they had a long deployment and did an excellent job. And now they are flying almost every day as a part of our assurance measures in the north and in the south. Why can we do that? Because we've invested wisely. They're some of the best flying, and that's what we'll continue to do into the future. All right, next question. The lady over there, yeah. Um, thank you, Ana Pisonero from the Spanish News Agency Europa Press over here. It's just a quick follow-up to my colleague's question. I understand that the Baltic states want a, a brigade uh, level from NATO to permanently uh, be placed in these countries. Is this actually feasible, given the compromise of NATO not to put uh, permanent boots on the ground, the reinforcement there. Um, and my second question would actually be on the Mediterranean, um, the possible mission, well, the mission that has been decided by the EU to uh, tackle the uh, mafia. Um, I understand that for now there could be some intelligence uh, sharing between NATO and the EU. I know that formally there's been no request from the EU, but I would just like to know if it's possible that both AWACS and also the, uh, the active endurance mission could provide this kind of intel of organizations. And if further down the line there is scope for more operational cooperation between both organizations, um, given that with the piracy we do have this kind of collaboration, I don't know, with detaining uh, smugglers eventually. Thank you. We take the first one. Yeah. Mm. So um, as to the requests, specific requests that are in the, uh, the paper that the uh, the three Baltic states have passed. Um, in Wales, our na national leaders chose to have our forward presence in the three Baltic nations and others uh, to be in a rotational fashion. And so right now, that is the way that we'll <coughs> accomplish forward presence. Of course, any request that a nation sends forward in such a serious manner, we will look at those requests as I described before. Jean-Paul and I will look at it from the training and employment um, uh, views, and then we'll pass to Brussels, to General Bartles and the military committee, our recommendations. Concerning uh, the uh, question raised as to uh, the in upcoming EU operation in the Mediterranean, uh, needless to say, we have been following very carefully the decision-making process uh, in uh, the European Union. 
Uh, day before yesterday, there was a military committee meeting in the European Union military committee, uh, to which I was invite, invited and participated in uh, part of the day, and where this issue was uh, touched upon. And finally, during our meetings over the last two days, the chair of the EU military committee has also been present. So uh, we are well informed, uh, we have kept each other well informed about what's going on, but ultimately a uh, a uh, cooperation, a dedicated official cooperation between European Union and NATO would be up to our uh, political uh, decision makers. Uh, and keep in mind that 22 nations of the European Union are also member of NATO and vice versa. So there is already uh, an extensive cooperation uh, within the nations, with in, be it in one organization or another. Thank you. May I just add a few words? Yes. Um, on these two uh, questions, first and foremost, to stress that we have, uh, as uh, Philip Bredlove stressed, uh, a, a, a very dynamic cooperation with the Baltic states. We are using uh, all the possibilities to improve our expertise, capabilities uh, through a dynamic uh, program of exercise, training, using uh, at the best their center of excellence for uh, cyber, uh, for stratcom, uh, for energy security. So there is a great cooperation and uh, I'm sure we will be able to answer together to their, to, to, to their legitimate concern. Uh, secondly, in the South, we have as well, uh, we discuss a partnership. Uh, we are improving the partnership with the Mediterranean and Dalek uh, countries, and this is absolutely crucial. They are very uh, adamant that uh, it, 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 was in, it would be improved. So we have a lot of uh, uh, common uh, projects uh, for uh, better training, better exercising, sharing our views, our perspectives. So, uh, and this is much in line with improving our cooperative security as well. Right, I have three questions uh, on my list. Uh, first question there, gentlemen. Uh, Japanese Daily, my, Nichi, my name is Saito. Uh, I'd like to ask two questions about the nuclear weapons uh, to General um, uh, Mr. Bridrup, uh, if possible. Uh, you already mentioned to our colleague, but uh, I'd like to ask once again. Uh, so, the Russia uh, mentioned some new new measures uh, to deploy, for example, nuclear capable missile or some uh, or a nuclear capable bomber in Crimea. So, my two questions: uh, the uh, in fact, what kind of change of uh, deployment of Russian nuclear weapons, uh, in fact, do you see? And the second question is: uh, the, Is there any? Do you feel something necessity to change the uh, uh, your nuclear weapons in Europe? To, to deployment, change the deployment of nuclear weapons in the European continent? So, just like you, we have watched uh, very senior Russian individuals down to lesser um, um, officials in the government all talk about uh, nuclear possibilities and deploying nuclear possibilities and the possibility of having used nukes if needed during the invasion and takeover of Crimea, the all, you've read all the stories which I've read. Um, first, I would like to say that this is really not very responsible talk from a nuclear power. And so we, uh, we do not support or endorse uh, uh, this kind of uh, positioning in, in the press with nuclear weapons. Uh, we have not seen any direct changes, but that does not mean that they may not have happened. Remember that lots of the the systems that the, the Russians use to deliver nuclear weapons are dual-use systems. They can be either conventional or nuclear, and some of those systems are deployed. But we have to be very clear, we have not seen direct evidence of any deployment of nuclear weapons. And the short answer to the last question is no, we do not need to make any adjustments to our nuclear posture. Most important and most foremost is we have a secure, a safe, and a very capable nuclear uh, response, and that's our mission, is to keep it that way. Next question, gentlemen. Uh, Radio Free Europe, uh, Ukrainian service, Vitaly Yeremitsa. Uh, 
Actually, I have uh, two questions. Uh, would you like to, uh, to say uh, what, uh, are, what was uh, the con concrete decisions, probably uh, ideas, to, uh, to help Ukraine after the, the mission uh, with the Ukrainian um, military commander? And second question is, uh, in Ukraine, uh, actually, there, there is uh, an idea uh, uh, that, that uh, Talking, uh, people talking about uh, it's uh, uh, installing in Ukrainian territory uh, NATO uh, anti-missile uh, 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 systems. How this idea? Uh, how, do, how do you find this idea here in, in NATO? Uh, coming to the first part uh, of your two questions, uh, in uh, as to uh, the meeting we had with the Ukrainian chief of general staff, uh, General Moshenko. Uh, we assessed uh, two items. First of all, he gave us an overview of the situation, <coughs> excuse me, in Ukraine as of today. Uh, and uh, he um, gave the status of the reforms of the uh, Ukrainian armed forces, which is taking place uh, with uh, NATO support, uh, either uh, indirectly through bilateral agreements with a number of allies, or directly through a number of trust funds which have been created uh, at the Wales uh, summit for the purpose of helping the transformation uh, of the Ukrainian armed forces. And that's where this part of uh, the discussion to, uh, which has taken place and our uh, cooperation and relation uh, with Ukraine is based exactly on what was decided upon in, in Wales. As to the BMD dimension, a very interesting dimension, we heard about it through the press. Philip, will you say a few words about that? Yes, I, I think really you should refer to the Ukrainian yep. uh, uh, delegation for that. We really don't have the details and have anything more than you have read in the press. Right. Ma'am? Uh, Terry Schultz with National Public Radio and CBS News. Um, I'd kind of like to skim three of the major topics um, <clears throat> and directed to uh, SACOR or also would welcome contributions from the others. Um, first of all, um, you... Uh, ISIS is storming across Iraq as we speak, and I would like to know if, um, b being that the counter-ISIS coalition is obviously not a NATO body, but all of the member states of NATO, I believe, are taking part, what does this say about the success of this coalition that um, cities continue to fall? Um, and uh, I think, um, Sakur, you mentioned that the migration crisis is driving terrorism. I'd like to know if that means you're lending credence to this, this belief that terrorists are hiding among the smugglers and thereby getting, getting to Europe this way. And finally, um, you also mentioned a lull in fighting uh, during which Russia is, is resupplying uh, the rebels. But if you read the OSCE reports, which I do dutifully, um, they're talking about new hotspots being opened. They're talking about continuous fighting in some areas areas. Um, their narrative doesn't seem to indicate there's a lull in fighting in some of the cities. Shirakhanad, I mean, is as, as hot as ever. And, and as I said, new hotspots opening. So um, what does that say about, um, about Russia's intention to fulfill anything about the Minsk agreement? Thanks. Let me uh, first touch uh, upon the uh, ISIL um, slant Daesh uh, dimension in, in Iraq. Um, as you quite, highly, quite rightly um, make clear, uh, this is a coalition which, uh, of a number of nations of which the NATO allies are members on an individual basis, which has picked up the fighting. Uh, I would be uh, more careful than you are in expressing that the ISIL Daesh is storming from city to city, etc. Yes, a city has been taken, another city has been retaken some time ago. Uh, it is more nuanced than that. Needless to say, uh, the uh, members of the alliance uh, which are facing that part of the region uh, are very concerned about the situation. Uh, the alliance as such has made sure that uh, the members of the, or the allies uh, cannot uh, be uh, touched by any kind of spillover effect from those uh, conflicts uh, in that region, uh, thus uh, making sure that uh, we protect our allies, which is the main purpose uh, of the alliance. Uh, Terry, a good read of my words. Yes, is the short answer. We do not know 
what is in these migrations coming across the Mediterranean from northern Africa into uh, our European nations in the south. And so we are concerned about all manners of movements. Some of these people are legitimate, legitimate refugees from ungoverned governed spaces. Others, we believe, are organized crime. And yes, we believe there could be elements of, uh, of extremists in them. And so this is a problem that we need to address. In the second case, maybe I didn't say it very well. Following the 12 February agreement, there was a period where we had a lull in fighting. And you are right, that is pretty much over. We see uh, uptick in fighting in several locations along the line of contact. But during that lull in fighting after the 12th of February, we did see all of the things that you have heard me talk about before. Training, resupply, uh, command and control improvements, organization, etc., so that the uh, Russian-led forces are better able to accomplish their objectives should they choose to do that now. Final question, yes. sir? Yes, uh, Brooks Singer, Jane's Defense. Speaking of Ukraine and support to it, uh, could you give us an update on what two of the trust funds have, have done uh, in terms of equipment provision, if there has been any on C4 and on logistics? Thank you. Personally, I do not have uh, the details here, but we could come back to you and give you uh, an updated uh, review of it. That was, uh, yeah, final question then. Um, sorry, it's just a very quick follow-up on the possible terrorists uh, being mixed with the immigrants in the Mediterranean. I mean, until now, NATO has not actually done too much to counter the, the, the foreign fighters problem. Um, we've always heard that this is more like an, an, an internal, uh, well, it's more for the ministers of interior than for, for a defense alliance as such. But to this point, are you willing to do something about this problem? Thank you. Uh, you can and yeah. I will as well. Uh, let, let me start out by saying uh, and highlighting what you exactly said, that uh, internal security issues of nations are the business of nations. Uh, beside that, in the European Union, there is an extensive cooperation between uh, various police forces uh, of the nations. Uh, what we have in NATO is that uh, we have the framework uh, where nations work bilaterally or multilaterally on information exchange which are relevant uh, to, uh, to these actions. And finally, let's not forget that we have Operation Active Endeavour, which is operating in the Mediterranean and which provides a picture which can be used, among others, uh, to counter uh, these, um, these movements of populations uh, which are organized by criminal elements. Yeah, I, I was just going to highlight the same. Groups of NATO nations are working bilaterally and multilaterally and actually doing quite a bit, joining other operations that are out there that are multilateral. And so uh, this is a problem and our nations are working on it, uh, as uh, Knut has, has pointed out. Thank you, and that uh, concludes uh, the uh, press conference uh, following the uh, military committee meeting in chief of uh, defense uh, session uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for attending. I will stay behind if you have any further questions or uh, questions for clarification. Thank you.